also from time, time into spectral modeling. So it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Yuri Poutonant as the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Vladek. Uh, good morning. And uh, the purpose of this talk is to uh, talk about actually spectral properties. I was asked to talk about spectral properties. But to my view, actually, uh, it's quite meaningless to talk just about spectral properties. Uh, because uh, in order to understand what's happening in the vicinity of compact objects, we have to look at spectral and timing properties together. It's, uh, I think the main purpose of today's talk is actually to show you that we have to forget about all the spectral models that we have been doing for a long time. If you've just been concentrating on spectra, we have to look at the same time and timing and whether these spectral models are consistent with the timing data. So uh, this talk is based on a uh, few papers that we have published recently, and these are a list of my co-authors. Uh, so the plan of this talk is uh, I will go first to review some old spectral decomposition of how to understand the X-ray and gamma ray emission in, in galactic black holes. I will talk a little bit more today about optical and infrared emission from uh, low mass X-ray binaries containing black holes, because I think this is something new. And uh, I will interpret also most of what we see today uh, in terms of the hot flow model. I may only mention some things that are related, but which are extremely important. Uh, these are uh, timing, uh, timing information, like X-ray time, time lags, Fourier resolved spectra. There is correlated variability in the X-rays between the X-rays and optical and even infrared. And also quasi-periodic oscillations that you can see in X-rays and optical at the same time. So let us go back maybe 15 years ago and look at the X-ray and time spectra, uh, or X-ray uh, spectra only, actually going even to the gamma rays. And Cygnus X1 was, uh, for many years, was the sort of the main source of studies where we see the spectral transitions from typical hard state when you have the most of the emission coming at 100 keV to the soft state where you have most of the emission coming at a couple of keVs. And uh, of course, this kind of uh, spectra, uh, Cygnus X1 doesn't vary very much uh, it's in its luminosity. It's much more uh, dramatic, uh, similar changes, but much, in much more dramatic fashion have been observed in, uh, in the X-ray transients. For example, XT1550, uh, you can see here a huge uh, low hard and uh, this high state, they're very similar to Cygnus X1, but then we have ultra soft and very high state which happen at a higher luminosities that are not, is not reachable in Cygnus X1. So where you see most of the emission coming from the accretion of standard called the accretion disk and some probably uh, non-thermal corona. Similar things happen in Cygnus X3, similar spectrum transitions, but this is a very, very strongly absorbed source. So you hardly can see anything below a few keV. Uh, so the standard paradigm for many years was that uh, these different spectral states can describe the different geometries of the, of the accretion disk, as I will show you later. But uh, actually, if you try to uh, look at the spectral properties only, uh, you can try to decompose the spectrum into the, in the soft state. It's a black body, like the spectrum from the standard accretion disk. But then you have this power log going up to almost 10 MeV, at least in some iterations. Uh, in, uh, this is data from, OS, uh, from uh, GRO, uh, Comptel. And this power tail can be interpreted as non-thermal containization. So where you have the uh, particles had uh, power uh, like distributions and comptonized in one single go disk photons to very high energies. In the hot state, this spectrum can be very well described by containization of thermal containization uh, of some seed photons. But, and because you see there are very sharp cutoff at about 100 keV. These sharp, uh, cutoffs are ubiquitous in all the black holes uh, in the hard states uh, once you have the data so of sufficiently good quality. But we also see these tails uh, extending up to a few MEVs. These are these um, blue crosses, again coming from Compton Gamma uh, Ray Observatory, but also, of course, now they, uh, they, there are a few, uh, few observations with integral also supporting this view. These weak non-thermal tails are uh, telling you that in, even in the hot state, there are some non-thermal particles. So thermal particles, thermal electrons will produce containization that will cut off at 100 keV, but there is contribution from non-thermal particles. 
And this is just uh, an example of that most of like the decomposition that you have some disk photons might decomponize produce some thermal quantization with the cutoff in the hot state with some weak tail that is not shown here. And you have this black body componized and getting up to very high energies uh, in the soft state. So the spectral transitions from hot, soft, and back are normally interpreted in terms of change in geometry of the inner uh, accretion flow. In the hot state, one thinks that you have an inner hot flow, uh, kind of advection-dominated flow or luminous uh, uh, accretion flow, a recent incarnation of that. Uh, and most of the energy is released in this optically thin, with optical depth about Thomson optical depth of the order of unity, plasma, and the disk emission is quite weak. In the soft state, the cold accretion disk goes all the way in, and the non-thermal emission that you can see in this going up to 10 MeV is produced in some kind of active coronas. These are probably by magnetic reconnection and uh, getting uh, non-thermal particles there will compromise the disk photons up to high energies. So this is a so sort of standard model that when you go from the hot to soft state, the inner disk radius of this cold attrition disk, it's called, called truncation radius, uh, has to decrease. And uh, the question is whether actually this uh, picture is, uh, uh, is uh, actually valid. I think it is, uh, there are a lot of evidences that supports uh, this uh, simple interpretation. And uh, first you see, correlated changes in a, a number of spectral parameters. For example, spectral index here on the left correlates with the reflection fraction, how much reflection do you have uh, in the spectrum. There is width of the iron line correlates with the same uh, with the reflection. You see the QPO frequency, which is, you can interpret as some uh, frequency associated with the Keplerian motion, but does need to be uh, necessarily Keplerian. It also uh, correlates with this. And the equivalent width of the iron line, which tells you about the strength of the reflection, also correlates with the reflection fraction, obviously. So all these things are correlated, and it's easily interpreted in the fact that the further in the accretion flow is, the larger you have the cold accretion flow is, the cold flow, uh, disk is, the larger you have reflection, the softer the spectrum becomes because you have more cooling from the accretion disk, you cool down the plasma in, in this hot flow, and the spectrum pivots a little bit, and you have softer spectrum. And the width of the iron line also correlates with the inner radius of the disk because it's just over effect. So there are further supporting evidences in uh, timing data that I will briefly mention. For example, we have this hard time lags where we have the hard photons de uh, delayed, de delayed relative to the soft ones. And what's plotted here is time lag versus Fourier frequency. You have this F to minus one typical behavior. And in this model of the hot flow, it's can be, this data can be easily interpreted. Just in terms of propagation uh, model by Lubarsky, you have some accretion, disk, uh, accretion, flow, uh, accretion rate fluctuations, sort of increase of the accretion rate. Uh, go fluctuation goes, propagates uh, through the accretion disk into the hot flow. And uh, once this propagates closer and closer to the black hole, the increase of the accretion rate uh, will lead to the uh, spectra which are evolving from softer to the harder ones. Well, in the hot flow, you would expect that uh, the region of the hot flow closest to the black hole uh, is, has pr is producing the hardest quantization spectrum, just because it sees the least amount of soft photons from the accretion disk. And the region which is closest to the cold accretion disk sees a lot of soft photons It will be cooler, might be cooler, and it will uh, produce softer spectrum. So th this will produce then evolution of the spectrum from the soft, soft to hard, and this will give you the time lags. And the typical size of the, this time lag duration of the order of a fraction of a second corresponds to the accretion time scale here. There are further evidence that's coming from so-called Fourier resolved spectroscopy. These are uh, uh, sort of spectra uh, at a different Fourier frequencies. So basically, you construct the power spectral density, and then you cut them off at different, uh, uh, so you produce this whole set of power spectral density at different energies, and then you just pick up one frequency and you plot what you have. And uh, you see at the low, fr uh, low, the low frequencies, you have this iron line with quantum reflection. At high frequencies, there is almost not pure power law. So which tells you again that where you have the highest frequency variability, probably in the innermost accretion flow, you don't have much reflection, and the spectrum is hardest. 
and the, uh, where you have the lowest frequency variability from the further away and the accretion disk in the hot flow closer to the cold disk, you have strong reflection features. And on the right here, you see the equivalent width of the iron line versus Fourier frequency. And in the hot state, you see there is a cutoff at uh, above uh, 10 hertz or even less. It means that actually iron line doesn't respond to the high frequency oscillations. So if you have some variability from the inner flow, the iron line doesn't respond to that actually because uh, the reflection uh, is happening much further away. That uh, so the, here the estimation is uh, at about 100 watt radii. So all this points to the picture of this varying uh, hot flow size or the varying truncation rate. So what's now new during the last years? is that we have a lot of uh, multi-wavelength uh, data in addition to the X-ray and gamma-ray data. And I will uh, now start talking about optical and infrared spectra. But in order to talk about this, I will show you the MEB spectrum again. And this is an MEB tail of Sigma 6 one which actually tells you that there are no thermal electrons in the system in the hard state. So I am showing you the MEB spectra if I'm going to talk about optical and infrared. Just because the same electrons that are producing MeV photons, they are also might produce synchrotron radiation if you have magnetic field in the accretion flow. And we believe that there is a magnetic field in the accretion flow. That's the only way you can sort of uh, produce enough viscosity in the accretion <coughs> to the matter to accrete. So if you have pure thermal plasma in the accretion disk, the synchrotron emission from that plasma is very strongly self absorbed. So you have luminosity of the order of 10 to 32 hours per second. So this is completely negligible from any point of view. Once you put a little bit of non-thermal electrons, 1% of energy into non-thermal electrons, the luminosity jumps up by a factor of uh, 10,000 or so, or about. And uh, it makes dramatic influence to the resulting optical infrared spectrum, because this emission is actually, as you see, this is in one electron volt uh, for the typical parameters of uh, like 10 Schwarzschild radii. So, the, the huge jump in the synchrotron luminosity is, is, can be easily explained just because uh, the emission that you see in the synchrotron is actually produced only by the very high energy table of the electron distribution. So it's a Lorentz factor about a few. And once you put even 1% of energy in non thermal particles, you increase dramatically synchrotron luminosity just because you, you put so many more high energy particles in the system. So what the effect, of course, is dramatic in the sense that now you produce a lot of synchrotron photons in the optical in infrared band, and therefore those synchrotron photons start competing with the disk photons for to start to cool the plasma, because the, these are photons that will be compromised by the like, thermal electrons in the gas. And so this, uh, we call them synchrotron of Compton models, similar to the models of lasers, but now they're slightly different just because Synchrotron photons are produced by non-thermal particles, but condensation here is happening by thermal particles. What's important that these synchrotrons of Compton spectra actually are going, so this is, you know, synchrotron photons here, and they are also, this part non-thermal particles will produce the tail, but the thermalization, condensation happens by thermal population of particles, which is this here, the particle population. So, uh, for 10 Schwarzschild uh, source, the peak of the synchrotron emission will be somewhere at a few electron volts. That's why it's important for our interpretation of optical and infrared spectrum. So this is the broadband spectrum of Swift 1753 here, going from radio up to uh, hard X-rays. And you see a few components here. There is a drop, of course, there are the jet at low energies uh, <coughs> producing the radio. There is X-ray uh, producing probably hot inner flow. And here you have optical infrared emission, and there are a few question marks. What's producing this emission? Is the jet that you can continue, continue from here? It's not clear because the jet actually, the radiation doesn't meet exactly the infrared and optical points. Or maybe this is the hot accretion disk that produces those emissions. And of course, you can have also a radiated disk, a standard disk, out part of the accretion disk that is contributing to this part of the spectrum. So it's actually a, a place where all the components can meet, jet, hot flow, and the accretion disk. Different, exa similar example of jet search 9 minus 4, you have jet emission in the radio, there is X-ray emission, this is a new spectrum, and you have something happening in the optical infrared, 
In the UV, actually, you start seeing the accretion disk. But here, in optical infrared, you have the spectrum which goes basically f nu goes like nu to the power 0. Again, the jet spectrum, if you take those two points, it doesn't go through the infrared optical point. It has completely different slope. So again, what's happening here? That's a big question. There is certainly some sources where this infrared and optical emission can be interpreted in terms of, jet, of the jet, because you have here, this was the recent paper by Russell in 2013, you have uh, radio points, you have infrared points here, and you have two power laws, and probably somewhere there is a couple. So here you have the radio jet, uh, synchrotron self-absorbed jet, and here you have optically thin emission from the jet. It seems that at least in some sources, this infrared optical emission is very well explained by optically thin emission from the from the, from the jet, but certainly not in all sources. So if we go back and ask the question whether the hot accretion flow can contribute to the optical uh, band, uh, it depends on the size of the hot accretion flow. If the hot accretion flow is just 10 shorter radius, the peak will be somewhere, the synchrotron peak will be somewhere in the UV, actually, so it's this red line. But if it's 30 shorter radius, it will go to the optical. If it's 100 shorter radius, it will go to the infrared, and if it's 300 shorter radius, it will go to the mid-infrared. Okay, the total spectrum from this extended hot flow will be a power law, and the power law index alpha here depends on the parameters, it depends on the particle distribution, it depends on the distribution of the magnetic field and optical depth through the accretion flow. But you can get easily this power law looking spectra in the optical infrared band, and the cutoff can be easily in the mid-infrared. Okay, does the model work? Yes, it does. This is again J series to nine minus four. We have the data coming from the uh, mid-infrared optical here, UV emission. Uh, there is uh, X-rays and there is a cutoff at hundred kV. All the X-rays are produced by the hot flow. These are th three components here, just three different zones from the hot accretion flows. But the l largest zone is producing actually need infrared emission by synchrotron. In addition, there is accretion disk here, or infra irradiated disk that produces UV emission. So this, this is just fit by eye, but tell, tells you that actually this model can easily explain all the infrared uh, and optical point. Of course, in this source also, the jet can contribute somewhere in the uh, far infrared, but it's very difficult to decompose uh, from this kind of data. Of course, as I said, timing is also important. And when you look at the spectra, you can look at the fast variability, but you can look also at the long time scale variability. Extra transients, they vary in the time scale of days or so weeks. So we can look at the optical infrared variability. And uh, he, here is just an example of uh, uh, outbursts of J39 minus 4 again, from a recent paper by Carvel. And what is shown here is the light curve in the X-rays. This is the black line, black points here. And the uh, light curves in the optical blue and the, in the knee infrared, right? <coughs> What's interesting that uh, in the high luminosity state, so the source was in the soft state, but then it transited to the hot state. It starts transition somewhere. Here it finished the transition where you have this dotted line. And when it's finished the transition, you have uh, the optical and infrared emission starts to increase. And there is an infrared flare, which the peak happens at about maybe 10 or 15 days after the full transition to the hot state. And uh, this is an interesting point, what's producing this optical infrared flares. <coughs> if you look at the broadband spectra from the same paper, yeah. there is a radio emission, so there, and there is this uh, infrared optical points, and you can clearly see that, the, for example, in this point two, this is just before the transition, there is a radio jet cannot contribute almost anything to the infrared band. During the transition, or after the transition, this point three, you have Herschel point also. It's a nice power law going to the power, to the, with the, with the connected to the radio. But in the optical infrared, there is excess that cannot be matched with this jet. Actually, the jet has to become optically thin and will cut off. It will become very soft here, but it will not be able to fit the data uh, in the infrared. And there are similar points here in the latent outburst that actually one can easily see that the jet cannot possibly contribute in the infrared points there. Even the authors come, come to the different conclusion. Uh, another outburst, XT1550, was observed, uh, for one of the outbursts was observed in 2000. 
and this is the X-ray light curve, and different colors uh, tell you about the different state. The red is the soft state, and blue is the hot state. And here's the uh, flux uh, hardness uh, diagram, or hardness intensity diagram. The source stuff, we start seeing it here at high flux, it's a very hot state, and then it goes to the soft state, and then goes back to the hot, and then drops. Okay, now if you look at the optical, you see that there is some flare in the optical. This is actually infrared band here. And then there is a secondary flare late in the outburst. And the secondary flare happens in the hot state. Again, so what is happening, what is producing these optical infrared flares? And uh, in principle, it's, it's possible to do the following. So in the soft state and the beginning of the transition, the spectrum of the optical infrared spectrum can be actually very well described by the black body or the irradiated disk spectrum. And so, and you see that actually the decay of these uh, light curves is uh, too purely exponential. So the magnitude goes linearly with time. So you can extrapolate this to the larger times well, uh, and subtract this emission of the accretion disk from the total emission. And you get the spectrum of this additional component that comes in. And here, uh, on this uh, hirschsprung russell diagram, basically it's the V magnitude, V minus H color. One can see this, this is the black body or the irradiated disk, and you see these deviations that expect the object jumps like that through the outburst. So the, these flares are very rare. So when you just look at the spectrum of the flare itself, it's of course very rare, but it does something like that. It makes this look here. The spectral index is shown here, the photon index. It starts, the flare starts with the index 0.7, plus 0.7. So it's actually quite hot spectrum. It never goes uh, softer than this index minus 0.2. So the, during the flare, it's actually has index of this flare is about zero during the peak of the flare. It's very consistent with the hot flow model, which I showed you just the composition of these different zones will give you this. And it's in completely inconsistent with the accretion, with the jet model, because the jet model actually uh, yeah, it predicts much softer spectrum. Okay. So, the hot flow model, uh, I will make a, f a short summary here, just if I don't have time to say anything more. <laughs> it explains the following thing. Of course, uh, we have seen already many years ago that uh, in the hot state, uh, the hot flow model can explain the X-ray spectra and all kinds of correlations. Uh, it can explain also MEV tails if you put uh, some non thermal particles there. So we call this model the hybrid hot flow model. The same model now can explain Paolo optical infrared spectra. Uh, it also explains the optical infrared hard spectra during these infrared flares. Because I will probably should explain it go back here and remind you how to produce the spectrum. So if you have the spectrum which cuts off here in the UV and you start increasing your accretion disk size, you will, at some point you will start seeing infrared emission. So when, this, when the size of the hot flow becomes 100 short radians, you will have infrared emission. So this is the tip of your infrared flare. And the accretion rate will drop after that. So therefore, the luminosity, all this luminosity will drop if the infrared and optical will drop after that. So the, the, this was sort of the, the main explanation for this uh, appearance of the flare and, the, and then it's, it's decay. And uh, actually, there was a recent uh, talk by Natalie Degenar that I, saw, uh, I heard in Annapolis where she was showing the beginning of the outburst of one of the black hole transients, recent black hole transients, 1910, and they saw the, these flares, but in the opposite direction. They go, because uh, you could see that this, uh, there was dips in the optical, in the infrared optical and UV band uh, in the beginning of the outburst. And this is just effective opposite to these flares. Okay, so uh, this more hybrid hot flow model, as I said, explains a lot of correlations in the spectral parameters. It explained, uh, it's consistent with the hard X-ray timing lags. And now in two minutes, I will try to show you a few more things. That, for example, it can explain complex uh, shape of the optical X-ray cross-correlation function, and also the uh, quasi-periodic oscillations that you can see in the optical in the infrared band. So in the optical X-ray uh, cross-correlation, we see sometimes this dramatic, uh, very strange behavior. 
uh, there are not so many objects uh, observed uh, together in the optical and uh, x-rays with the high time resolution, but uh, I think it's three, by, uh, but now three or four. But you can see that there is optical, when the optical leads, there is a, they actually anti-correlate with each other, and when there is optical delays, then they are correlated with each other. It's very difficult to understand if you have just one component. But if you have two components in the spectrum, uh, in the optical infrared spectrum, and I told you that actually we have at least two components, they could be irradiated disk and there could be synchro from emission from the hot globe, then this cross relation function can be easily explained. Synchrotron emission from the hot flow is expected to be anti-correlated with the X-ray emission. Because once you increase the accretion rate, you increase also the optical depth in the hot flow, and you increase opacity there. Therefore, the synchrotron luminosity will drop. And therefore, you will have this pivoting between, uh, so between the optical infrared and X-rays, there will be pivoting somewhere in the UV hot, uh, or soft X-rays. And they, therefore, the synchrotron mm -hmm. emission will be anti-correlated with the x-rays. Of course, once you irradiate the outer accretion flow, this optical infrared emission will be correlated with the x-rays. It will be slightly delayed, and it will be smeared. So now, if you put those two things together, I will just show you the cross-correlation function. So the synchrotron and x-rays are anti-correlated. Therefore, in the cross-correlation, what you see is actually a negative contribution from the x-ray uh, autocorrelation function. So it will be shaped like that. And the irradiated emission is delayed and correlated. Therefore, it, it will be slightly smeared, shifted to the right, and you will have a peak in the cross-correlation function, positive peak, shifted to the right. Now you sum those two things together, and you get this complex shape, which actually fits the data very well. So two component model fits the data, but one of the components can be the hot flow model. Can be the hot flow. QPOs. People have seen QPOs in the optical actually for already 30 years ago, probably we should celebrate, yeah, because the, there was a paper by Moch in 1983. In JXX9-4, there was a strong optical quasi-periodic oscillation at about uh, 0.1 hertz, 0.06 hertz, at the same frequency where you have X-rays. These data are not entirely simultaneous, and there's actually X-ray and there are a few harmonics there. There was recent observation with optical QPOs in 1753, <coughs> How do you produce the QPOs? One of the most recent uh, model uh, for X-ray QPO was uh, discussed uh, by Adam Ingram, and it's based on the paper by Fragile, which tells you that actually less steering precession of the thick hot flow will force the whole flow to precess as the solid body. Okay, if this is true, if this black hole spin is misaligned from the orbital spin, the whole hot flow will precess. And of course, if you have hot flow precession, that you will modulate the X-rays. But at the same time, you will modulate the optical emission because the optical emission will come from the 30 Schwarz radius from the same hot flow. So it's nature you will have optical and X-ray emission modulated at the same frequency. So you do expect that the, you see emission of QPOs at the same frequency and uh, in optical and the in, in the X-rays, sometimes in Swift 73, for example, you see the very uh, clear signature of the QPO on the optical here, but the, there is it hardly can be seen on the X-rays just because we have a huge uh, amplitude red noise. But if you plot the cross correlation function, then this is what you see. You see sinusoidal variation in the cross correlation function. The only way to produce sinusoidal variation in the cross correlation function is that you will have the same periodic oscillation the X-rays too. You don't see them in the power spectrum density, but you see in the, in the cross correlation function. So you do see simultaneous periodic oscillations in the X-rays <laughs> and the optical. There is an exa another example from uh, Pierre George Casella paper, which is not public, but I think he shows it on the on the some of the, during his talks that you have infrared emission uh, oscillate, uh, correlating with the X-rays, and uh, this is uh, six hertz. So, so this is probably very compact hot flow that probably you need to go below 10 schwarz radius. But actually, the infrared emission at this point produces a QPO, but there is nothing in the, the mid-infrared. Actually, it's clearly not cannot be produced by the jet. OK, and the final conclusions are the following that in the hot state, synchrotron self-compton model in hybrid plasma 
plays an important role. It probably dominates the whole spectral production. You have the cold accretion disk with a few percent of energy there, but it's, it's not involved in the condensation. But when it starts in, uh, to be moving or becoming closer to the uh, black hole, then you can produce, it will influence, it will make the spectra softer, and then you'll produce all kinds of correlations there. Uh, okay, so uh, an extended hot flow model, it means that you have hot accretion flow has to be 100 or 30 or 100 or 300 short <coughs> radius, will naturally produce power law optical inference spectra. Okay. This model will also explain a lot of extra retirement features. And if you have two components in the optical infrared the reprocessing and seeing the hot flow, then you can also reproduce the complex shape of the cross correlation function. You can also produce QPOs together in optical infrared and X rays by the processing hot flow. And now one of the question is uh, that where does no thermal particles coming from? Because it seems that phenomenologically we can explain everything once you put a small fraction of the energy in non thermal particle. Now uh, we need to find the source of this non thermal particle in the hot flow. Is it magnetic reconnection because of the MRI uh, turbulence there? Is it particle acceleration because of the turbulent motion, some kind of diffuse, diffuse acceleration? Or it could be some shocks that you know, so sometimes people are talking about the shocks, small, weak shocks in the efficient flow. Any of those could, in principle, produce non thermal particles. And maybe we'll have now uh, a way of uh, studying uh, actually, uh, how much energy do we need in non thermal particles to explain the data. And then we will learn something what's happening actually in microphysics, what's happening in the efficient in the flow. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you.